Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for sticking around into the afternoon. Um, so I'm Eric Meyer. Um, <laughs> definitive guide, the reset. I didn't do any of that. That's some other guy with red hair. We have the same middle initial. I'm this one, the one that puts an and in the middle so that you don't get us confused. Yeah, I'm over here. This arrow down here is pointing over there, which is really confusing me right now. <laughs> so anyway, I make artsy bullshit. I also work at Oddbird, uh, which I founded a couple years ago. Um, I developed Suzy. I'm on the Compass team. Uh, Suzy, I'm sure some of you have seen it. True is the new testing system that I put out recently. Still really, really in alpha, uh, working on that. But this is the results from the Suzy tests. Uh, and then another plugin that I have, because I'm supposed to talk about plugins today, uh, is just my, central, my simple collection of accoutrements, uh, things that aren't big enough to give you, but they're all public there. Um, so you can check them out. And I use those on a lot of my projects. And I'm going to talk about showing your work, which is something that teachers always said to me in elementary school math, which I wasn't good at, uh, and I'm still not. Um, but the reason for showing your work is so that when they look at it, they know what you've done, and they know how to tell you how to fix it. Uh, or where you made mistakes, where you didn't, uh, what techniques you used. To build plugins for SAS, you don't need any Ruby skills. I don't have any. You don't need any original ideas. I don't have any of those either. <laughs> you don't need a plan. You don't need, an ex you don't need experience. And you don't need followers. So when I built Susie first. I had just found at Oddbird. I had just left my job at a small insurance company where I was working as a print designer. And I was doing some web work on my own. And I went and found one client who I thought could help me transition into working for myself. And I started building websites. Very little experience. Very little client work. Just started doing it. Uh, this is my brother over here. He's a Django dev. So I just hooked up with him. And we started doing the thing in 2008. In 2008, I also saw this. I just saw the slides. I didn't see the actual presentation. Uh, Natalie Downs' CSS systems, uh, where she suggested a way of organizing your CSS and also uh, a layout system that used uh, M's or pixels or anything to set an outer container. And then everything inside of the container would be sized with percentages. And that allowed for you to make any change at any time to what type of grid you were building, uh, how big it was, uh, anything like that. So making a system that was flexible for the development process was part of the idea behind that. And I read that, and I started doing it. But it was a pain in the ass. Um, this, is, this is really all it takes. The target divided by the context is the multiplier. And it's that one algorithm that supports the entire structure of what she does. And what I started to do, but in your code, it starts to look like this. I mean, if you can actually show the work which you can in SAS. This isn't, this isn't, you can't do this. It's too much. That's insane. But I was. Every, like, I had a calculator by my desk. And every time I needed to span part of a grid, I would type it in, do that over and over. right? And it's always the same algorithm again and again and again. But it's quite a bit. 2009. I got this picture from him last night. Fantastic. 2009, I saw uh, Chris's video showing what Compass and SAS could do. And actually, I only saw it because I was telling my brother 
how I was frustrated doing the same math problem again and again. And he said, well, there's this video that this guy just put out. Check it out, see if it's useful. So I did. And I wrote Susie in one file that evening after watching the video three times through. Four settings, five mix-ins. It's just that algorithm. That's all it is. Uh, and I don't know programming. I don't know Ruby. I don't know math. I knew how to do context and target to get a multiplier. So I did that. And that was basically that one mix-in was Susie. And I didn't know anything about GitHub. I didn't know anything about open source. So you can see the first commit on Suzy is my brother who took my code and put it on the webs and said, here, people might want this. You should do this with it. See the old, the old syntax. If you never got to use the old syntax, good. <laughs> and I put this example with it, which I'll show you what that does. I had no experience with what I was doing. That's what it builds. Wonderful. <laughs> Everybody wants to build that. <laughs> so Chris wrote back to me when I posted this and said, is this what it's supposed to look like? <laughs> and I said, uh, no. <laughs> it's not. That's not what it's supposed to look like. But I had, never read, I had never written documentation before. I had no idea what I was doing. I just put in some numbers that seemed to make sense to me, right? Those, every single one of those is a reasonable thing to type in. But it doesn't build anything. So the main thing, Susie came about through community review. I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew the algorithm, and I knew that I had a problem I needed to solve. And Chris was the first to point out what I needed to fix. And then a lot of other people started pointing out things I could fix. And it just kept growing. And it was the first grid system really built not as a port of what you could do in CSS, but really trying to do something that you could only do in SAS. I mean, the problem was there's no way to do this kind of math in CSS. There's no way to do the nesting with classes. You end up with uh, 1,000 classes. It gets exponential, uh, and it's terrible. So SUSE is only possible with SAS, whereas something like 960 grid or uh, the other ones, you know, are all, they can be written in CSS, they can be written in SAS, they get a little bit better in SAS, uh, but SUSE was really only possible this way. Uh, but then it was the community that took it and uh, started building it out and started telling me what to fix, and I learned all the SAS that I know, I learned from people telling me how to do it better. A lot of these people. I also learned what Susie was. Uh, I had no idea. I still only realized recently as I was getting ready to put out Susie 2.0, which is coming really soon. I'm sorry, I spent my time building slides instead. Um, I realized, I looked back at the docs, and I looked at how people have been using Susie, and I realized I documented it completely wrong, and I sold you the wrong thing, I mean, for free. So don't complain. <laughs> but I, for me, Suzy was the functions and the little pieces that could create the bigger system. And what I documented was the big shortcuts. And so what people were using was the big shortcuts. And what I meant to build was the little modular pieces. Uh, and so it was the wrong thing just because I had put it out there wrong. I had documented it wrong. So, and you can learn a lot just by watching what people do with it. Susie became a very different thing after I started to see how people wanted to use it. At first, I was very, very opinionated about exactly what it should do, what code it should write. And what I realized later was that really what made it good was that it was flexible and that people wanted to use it any way they wanted and that I was writing for experts. And the way to write for experts is to give them more power. And so I started stripping out all of my opinions. Uh, and I think that's been helping. 
Are there any questions on that part before I go on? No? So sharing your toys. This is more or less how I go about thinking of writing a plugin and, and building one and sharing it. Plugins are byproducts. A lot of my plugins come from, and I, I have a ton. Most of them are just small, and they're in my accoutrement file. But what they are is you find where your code is not dry, and you make it dry, and the thing that you've pulled out, that's a plugin, and that's it. It's, it's what's left when you've started drying your code. Uh, so that's where they all come from, and uh, I feel like that makes them better because I know that they solve a problem. Because I had a problem, I used it three times, that's why the code was not dry, that's why we need a plugin. So I'm guaranteed that this plugin is useful for me right when I build it. There's no new idea there. I didn't have to have an idea. The other thing is to build the smallest thing possible. Um, yeah. I'm going to get to this a little bit later. SAS, this SAS is greater than CSS. Uh, that may be true in the sense of uh, how good it is, but really what I'm, what I'm interested in here is the fact that SAS does something different. And I see a lot of plugins, most of the plugins that I see coming out are simple ports of something that CSS could already do. And there's so much that SAS can do that CSS couldn't do. Uh, and I'm really interested in seeing that. Uh, and what happens when we're building plugins in CSS instead of libraries. And that's what I was talking about with Susie. There's no way to build it in CSS. Uh, and if you can find things to build in SAS that aren't simply the way it was done, if you can think different about how, it's, how to solve the problem. CSS solved problems with libraries. That's how we did it for a long time. And it gets ingrained. And so when we look at an old grid system and we think, oh, how do I build a grid system in SAS? We think, well, we take the old grid system and we use placeholder and we use extends. But I think it's bigger than that. There's so much more power to what SAS can do. Uh, and, it's, and we need to be rethinking the old libraries and figuring out what they are now. So for me, that's building systems instead of solutions. Things that come apart into very small pieces and help you build a thing. I want to give you a paintbrush instead of painting your house for you. And there's a lot of plugins out there that paint your house for you. They give you already done buttons or something. And some of those are great. They're great plugins. There's nothing wrong with them. But they're only useful once or twice. And then you have a site that needs buttons that look different from that. And what you really need is a tool that helps you build buttons, not a tool that gives you three buttons. Uh, and so I want to see more of that. And that's what I always try to do when I'm thinking about how this plugin, a new plugin, is going to work. Uh, in terms of actually pulling that off, functions are fantastic, and settings aren't enough. So just saying, well, here's a setting where you can change the background color of the thing there, don't you have what you need, usually doesn't cut it. Uh, the people that are using SAS plugins want to build their own thing. You need to give them as much control as possible. And functions are great at that because they let you adjust the input to exactly the output and then use it where you want it uh, in a more detailed way. So this is an example. This is one that I built recently just because I wanted it. Uh, it was just a CSS only tabs. Just works the way you would expect. Uh, using John Alvin Wilkins float isolation to keep them all the same size even though they have different content. He can tell you more about that if you want. Um, so I built that. 
And then I was trying to figure out how to make a plugin out of it. And I did. I made this plugin. And this is basically how it works without the paint job. Uh, I just added the bolding there so that you can basically see. But I stripped out all of the paint that I could. Everything that I could take out, I took out. And then I had this in my accoutrement file. And I started using it on sites, but I realized that I really wanted it to work differently on every site. And I realized the same technique could be used for accordions uh, and any other number of UI elements. So I took what was this, the tabs mix in, and I changed it to toggles. Because it's really just the one thing. I want to take a radio input or a checkbox input, and I want to toggle something based on its state. And I've been using that everywhere now, and I like it so much better than the big one that does all the things for me. Because this one lets me build my own. I can now build this one per site using this. And it lets me move from one site to the next and have the tools that I need really quickly to build the new site. Writing tests for SAS is a strange thing and a new thing. Uh, you can try true. I wrote true because I, was, I had never written tests before. I'm a designer. I don't know. Tests? What's that? I don't know how to do that. So I was talking to my brother who does our JavaScript, and I was like, what do your tests look like? What's, what, do you, what do you do? And he showed me. And I said, oh, I can write that in SAS. It's just a couple functions and mix-ins. Uh, so I did. This is, a, this is using true for Suzy. Simple assert equal, or there's also assert unequal, or assert, or assert true, or assert false. And then it collates all the results. Uh, and I don't think I put a slide up here of the results. But it gives you for each, for each test, and you can create test modules. It gives you the results of all of them and uh, where there were errors. Uh, and then a nice printout. Um, but that's a, that's a really new thing. Uh, I think it's a really good idea for any plugin that's going to go public. Uh, and it's been really helpful as my plugin grows. Uh, it's really nice if you can start writing the tests early on, and then as you grow, have them there. There have been lots of times where, in the early days of Suzy especially, I would push something out too quick. I hadn't considered all the use cases. I use Suzy in one way, and it turns out that there are too many users out there for me to understand how all of them are using it. Uh, so I really need the tests to cover that uh, so that I don't have to remember how you use Suzy. Once you're to the point of having something that you want to share, these three documents are really helpful and a good place to start if you have nothing else. And I think the main thing that I want to convey today is that you should just push your code. It doesn't matter. You don't have to be ready. It doesn't have to be done. It doesn't have to look pretty. It doesn't have to have a website for it. Add a readme, and then add a license. Maybe add a license first. And I can't tell you a lot about adding licenses. Uh, in my mind, it's more about telling other people how they can use my code more than it is about any legal anything. It's really a way of saying, I'm part of this community that shares code this way. Uh, so I use the MIT license because Compass uses the MIT license and everybody else is using it. So you know, I want to share my code that way, so I do. Uh, because copyright is confusing otherwise, if you don't state it. A readme, good basic, basic documentation if you have nothing else, at least give some examples and tell people what it is you've put out. And a contributing doc, I haven't done this until real recently. Wait, no, I haven't done it at all. And I'm going to start. I think this is a really good idea. I just saw it the other day. And I said, yeah, that would really solve a lot of my problems. Because you get a lot of the same questions again and again if you put out a plugin and people start using it. So having a document there with your code saying, uh, these are, this, these are, this is what I want the code to look like. This is what you need to do. You need to add the documentation and the tests for me to accept a pull request. All of that sort of information, whatever it is for you, 
and you can keep updating that as the plugin grows. Like I talked about with Susie, the uh, what I documented was what people used. Uh, and so I actually, I feel like I failed on that in a way. I wanted people to use one thing, and I don't really actually care if I control what you use. But I wanted you to at least know that there were these functions, and I never told you they were there. Uh, and so most people didn't know there were the functions. And I would regularly get the same questions over and over. How do you do this? How do you do this? And I would say, well, you use the functions, but I didn't document them, so good luck. <laughs> and that doesn't really work. So whatever you document is what exists. And it can be hard and boring. Uh, but if you want people to use the tool, they're only going to use what they can figure out. And the documents make that possible. Respond to issues quickly and kindly. Uh, this seems obvious, maybe. Uh, it can be hard, too. You can start to get a lot of uh, issue requests, feature requests, issues, questions. Um, but even just getting back to say, uh, sorry, I don't know yet. Give me some time. <laughs> um, it's, you're being part of a community if you're sharing your code. And being responsive is part of that. The community is going to help you out. So once a project grows, you can start thinking about Ruby Gems, Compass. Uh, I get a lot of requests to tag all my versions. And I don't actually know. Like, I'm not a developer. Maybe I've said that before. I don't actually know what people use this for. I have no idea what that's for. That. Sorry, I'm pointing at the wrong screen. I don't know what people do with that. But they want it, so I started doing it. Uh, I, I use Compass to distribute. I use RubyGems to distribute. These seem like standards in the community, so I use them. Bower and Yeoman are new and do similar things, uh, or some of the same things. Uh, so you could look into them. But uh, finding these other avenues for getting your code out besides just GitHub is sort of the next step after you've put it there and documented it. Oh, Compass is always also great uh, for the libraries that it provides. There are developers who don't like to use them because they would like to have their own library, or they don't need all those things, or they use some other tool to cover that. It's really great for plugins because you're not worrying about having namespacing issues. Uh, you're using a central set of tools. Uh, and if everybody starts using those, you can count on not conflicting with other plugins. And so that's a really helpful piece of Compass, even though there are some frustrations some developers have with it. Uh, so I recommend that, but up to you. And really, just make shit up. It's SAS is new. CSS is pretty new. But all of this, it's really new. And nobody, we're all pulling it out of our ass. Nobody knows. Chris doesn't know. I've been hanging out with him the last couple of days. He has no idea. Just make shit up. Just play around with it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it sucks. It doesn't matter if your code is ugly. Put it out there. And that's why this community is here. Because we'll, we'll see if there's a good idea in it. And we'll start playing with it. And we'll make it better. And you'll get all the credit, which is the cool part. That's it. That's me. Uh, and that's plugins. And I'd be happy to answer questions. What are some of the things that you've learned from users that are using Suzy, um, like stories that you've got, or like pull requests, like issues, things like that, that like kind of like blew your mind? You're like, oh, I never like thought about using it that way, or that made you like change the way that you did something? Right. Oh yeah. So there's a, there's a lot that made me change the way I did things. Um, there's, I mean, Suzy at the beginning only did grids that were. M's on the outside and percents on the inside, and that's it. That's all it did. Uh, and I was adamant about keeping it that way until I realized that sometimes you want to build a site some other way. 
and why should this tool only do the one thing when really it's just one math problem at the core of the tool. It's not like that math problem is only useful for that way of doing things. So I held on to the idea that a tool should just do one thing, but I changed what that meant for me, right? That one thing for Susie should be layout, not that one thing being floating things to the left and putting a right margin on them with percentages. That's not the one thing that Susie should be. Um, so realizing that I wanted to define it by the broader idea that people were trying to accomplish rather than defining it by the specifics of my approach uh, would be one of the big ones. Yeah, in Compass, point. Compass actually, sorry, I forgot to mention that. Compass has a great, uh, some documentation on how to create a plugin for them. Really, the thing is, uh, to start with, you don't need to worry about it to get started. Uh, just write it, write your code, and that's already a usable extension. If you want to turn it into a Compass plugin, there's basically three lines of Ruby that I copy into a file called suzy.rb that's in a lib directory. And I have no idea what any of that means, but I copy these three lines in, and I change where it said fancy buttons. I changed that to suzy. And then I was done, <laughs> right? And then you have a plugin for Compass. But then if you want to create a gem, then you find somebody that has something called a gem spec, and you copy that file over, and then you type in some things. I looked it up on the internets. <laughs> uh, type in, you know, build gem, and then push gem, uh, and there it goes. It's all kind of magic. I don't know. But it's, it's really easy. Like, there's just those, just those little steps to get it to the various places, and each one of them has it documented really well. So Compass will have what you need to do for them documented, and it really is three lines. And uh, Ruby Gems has the same sort of documentation, and that's all there for everybody. So it's anybody can do it. Cool. Yes. <laughs> tomorrow. Uh, yeah, totally tomorrow. Well, it's really it's really just about just about there. Um, so I should probably tell you this. If you build a plug-in and it becomes somewhat popular, uh, never promise when it's coming, because you can't do it. This is open source. Nobody's, nobody's paying you. And sometimes you have to build slides instead. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's really got all the features that it needs to be usable. There's one, there's one thing that somebody just pointed out to me, that Suzy1 always did it a certain way. But now that I see it, I feel like it's a huge bug. And I'm not going to tell you what it is, because then you'll think it's a bug. It's not a bug, but it just bothers me now that I see it. What is it? Oh. So when you, when you use the, the push and pull at pre and post, the margin and padding uh, mix-ins, it always assumes you're pushing off of an edge, uh, not a gutter. So it doesn't account for an extra gutter, which nobody's complained about, and I've never run into before. But suddenly somebody pointed that out to me, and I said, oh, right, it should be able to do both of these things. So that's actually the delay right now, is I'm going back. I just wrote all the tests. They're all failing, uh, <laughs> because I have this new thing that I want it to be able to do. So now I have failing tests for that. I'll get it written, <laughs> and then I'll be able to push it out and not feel like I've betrayed you by knowing about this one problem that nobody's complained about in four years. So until now. So it's coming soon. I was going to try to get it out this weekend. We'll see if that's possible. Thanks. Go make crazy shit that Chris never thought of and Nathan never thought of, because that's what 
you should do. Thank <laughs> you.